Hi, this is your host, Abdul Bharti, and welcome to another ep- edition of Linux and Open Source Security with Alex Gnars, uh, CEO and co-founder of Polyverse. Alex, uh, first of all, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Swapnil. It's a pleasure as always. A new report has come out from Veracode, a state of software security. We will talk about the report itself because, you know, they have some very interesting points like, you know, how much uh, vulnerability is there, how many applications have flaws. But there's something even more interesting that we want to talk about. And that is like when we look at these reports, uh, as we were talking earlier, uh, it's like a street light effect. You know, there is a very, very you know, <laughs> that you look for where it's obvious, right? You know, the whole joke around is the drunk man was there looking for his lost keys under the street light, and the cop asked, "Did you lose it there?" He said, "No, but that's where the light is." So, so people tend to look for these things where they expect these flaws to be, but it could be somewhere else. So, what I want to understand from you in the securities space, how would you define, you know, a street light effect? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for the question. First off, the Viracode report is uh, fabulous. They do a great job every year. And for those of you that haven't read it, I would highly recommend uh, reading it. Uh, there's a lot of great data in there and it's it's very insightful. Uh, but like you, like you said, Swapno, you do have to read that report uh, with a mindset of being aware of the street light effect. And the issue with uh, you know where the streetlight effect applies here is this idea that they're only reporting on the data and issues that their tools can find. So if their tools can't find a particular issue, it goes unreported. Or even as they say in the report, they they're actually very candid about this to their credit. Uh, you know, as their tool has evolved over the last ten years. You know the types of re- types of um, issues that they find and the percentage of the issues does change over time, and that is reflected in the data. So you know, much like the drunk looking for his keys uh, under the streetlight because that's where the light is, um, you know, same thing is happening here. They're reporting on all the things that they were finding under the streetlight. In this case, the streetlight being the Vera Code uh, analysis tools. If we just quickly look at some of the key findings, one is that you know I think this time they scanned like what eighty five thousand applications, and out of those, eighty three percent was flagged as containing at least one security flaw, which is kind of a high percentage. Uh, so um, why are so many applications flawed with security risks? What about the whole code hygiene? You know that the code itself is clean. Uh, if you want to take a very mathematical uh, look at it, Alan Turing essentially proved that it is impossible to build completely correct software. Uh, and it's impossible to even know what completely correct software is. Uh, if you consider something like the um, Spectre or Meltdown attacks, these were ones where they took advantage of, the attack took advantage of timing disclosures in the cache of the chip. Now you could do all of the software analysis you wanted to do, but without sort of understanding the context of the hardware that the software is running on, there's no way that any analysis tool would have discovered a priori, you know, a Spectre or Meltdown type issue. And so the fundamental challenge that these systems are just so complex, you cannot build a provably correct system. And if you can't build a provably correct system, then the, uh, you know, for any non-trivial system, let me say it like that, you know, for anything real world, then the there's always going to be limits to the effectiveness of these kinds of tools. Now that said, this is probably a good opportunity to, to bank my pitch. If you're not using some form of software analytics, uh, whether it's Veracode or or Fortify from Microfocus or Semel from Microsoft, please do. These these tools are like spell check. Uh, spell check is not going to find every last misspelling or every last grammar error or every last issue in your in your emails or documents. But you'd sure look like a fool if you if you had elementary spelling mistakes that a that a spell checker would would uh, would have caught. So just like you're going to run spell check on an important document. Run, run these software analy- analysis tools on your code. 
They're not going to find everything like we were just talking about, but they will find a set of things. So run them, find it, fix it. Now, this SIP report also kind of shows that uh, the, the security debt continues to pile on. Uh, but uh, if you look at applications that are you know regularly scanned, they have like less than 30% security debt. So what is that? And is it just for applications or is the companies are all accumulating security debt in terms of operating systems or OS as well? Yeah, that was probably the most interesting part of the report uh, as I read it. Because even if you take the uh, phenomena of the streetlight effect or this observer bias, what was fascinating in this report was that every application they looked at you know, had a significant degree of, of security debt. Even when those applications were able to stay on top of, uh, you know, regular fixes for all the all the high high security items, and that kind of gets back to our earlier point in discussion about every system is going to have uh, flaws and bugs. Maybe at the risk of getting a little too detailed, if you look at some of the most sophisticated attacks happening today, the so-called blind ROPs and JIT ROPs. This is work done by Stanford and others uh, in the latest in sort of security research. They're able to perform attacks on uh, using information disclosed from a perfectly functioning API. Because an API is always going to leak information fundamentally. An API call, whether it's a web request or a kernel call or what have you, will always return success or failure. And as it turns out, just success or failure is enough information leakage that a patient attacker can use that success or failure to gently probe your system and affect an attack. So it's kind of hard to get away from having APIs because that's, that's fundamental to your, to your system. That's how computers work. And so if even the fundamental definition and fundamental workings of, the, of your system are exploitable, there are going to be issues. Punchline security debt is almost uh, inevitable and unavoidable. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but more thing is that uh, when we're talking about code hygiene, our lady mentioning, you know, bugs are part of software development. You know, it's just, you know, as you mentioned, typos, uh, when you write, there will be typos. There's nothing it, it can be done about it. What is really important is that how quickly are you fixing those grammar and, you know, errors and typos? Do they end up in production, you know, when you read an article in, you know, Washington Post or whatever it is. So let's in the, in the security context, having, you know, flaws is fine. But what really matters is how frequently you're looking and fixing it and how long it takes to actually fix it. And in some cases, it appears that it was taking almost, you know, more than two, two or three months. So uh, talk about that also based on the report and what you have seen in general, what is the frequency of fixing and how long it takes to fix because that is when it creates a window for any attacker to come and compromise your system. Absolutely. Uh, although so, no, I, I fully agree with what you said, the frequency of fixing and the, and the speed at which you can do it is very important, particularly for the most severe bugs. But what I would argue is even more important is uh, thinking about security at the architecture level. So one spot where I would disagree with you is the idea of saying you can't do anything. The bugs are inevitable, but you can't do anything about it. Well, bugs are inevitable. You can't do anything about fixing every bug, but you can take an architectural approach um, to, your, to your system, a security architecture approach to make it more resilient. Uh, to give an, a, an example, uh, since, you know, at least at the time of this recording, uh, the Supreme Court, you know, judge nomination is dominating the news. If you take a step back and you sort of think about, you know, our political system as a system, as an architecture, what we've effectively said is that there will be evildoers in the world. So as much as you might want every human to be nice and ethical and honest and, and a good person, there will be bad people. And so as a society, we've said our systematic, our system, you know, our architecture uh, for dealing with, um, uh, you know, bad people is the justice system, you know, police and the courts. And, and then even then we have a, a series of courts to, to try to, you know, ensure as much fairness as possible. 
And so that's a that's a design in in sort of a, in, in the political sphere of a more uh, of a system that assumes that and acknowledges that there will be bad people in the world. In the same spirit, if we know and understand that there will be bugs in systems, how do we design a, a system that can be secure? Well, we can take uh, you know take comfort or insight from what's been done in cloud computing. In cloud computing, you say, well, we know that every one of our components is buggy. Uh, the hardware may fail, the disk drives may fill up, the software may crash, but we can still build a reliable and resilient internet by knowing and assuming that these pieces are gonna fail and we have failover and, and, um, and you know, hot, hot systems, active, active systems and so forth to, to, to compensate for the inevitable failures. If you take that same idea in software security, then if you look at the different classes of bugs, if you look at say memory, memory, uh, memory bugs and memory exploits, well, you can address those by using uh, memory safe languages like Rust, or JavaScript, .NET, or so forth. And if you use uh, a memory safe language on top of a polymorphic operating system, now you've got a lot of resilience against memory attacks because the underlying operating system is constantly changing things and constantly changing memory layout. And the application itself is designed in such a way that with a language that these memory exploits don't work. Script injection was another case. You can use polymorphic script engines. Uh, authentication was another class of bugs. If you do multi-factor authentication, it becomes less severe uh, if a password is discovered or guessed. So every one of these um, sort of design elements, whether it's encryption or multi-factor authentication, you know, uh, memory safe languages or polymorphic operating systems, every one of these things becomes a choice that if you take that choice and take that architecture decision, you can dramatically reduce um, the surface area of issues you need to worry about. Yeah, uh, we have talked about polymorphing and polymorphing basically, uh, I wish people talk more about it because it's Happy to. <laughs> totally, no, because it totally, you know, kind of eliminates or uh, that is not even the right word that it really doesn't matter if there are bugs in the software because it doesn't really matter because you are running a unique instance of whatever, whether it's application or OS that you're running there. So you are still, of course, you should still go and patch in there, but you don't have to worry about an attacker compromising one system and then leveraging that to compromise everything else. Uh, I, will, I would like to talk more about polymorphing, but before that, what I do want to talk also about, since you did mention cloud, and when we do talk about cloud, we cannot not talk about DevOps. And now in, when it comes to security, it's like DevSecOps. So some of the problems that you mentioned earlier, whether it's street life effect, that is to look at where the problem might be versus uh, keeping the code hygiene versus you know keeping the code patched frequency. How does DevSecOps uh, change? Because it's all about a paradigm. It's all about you know the processes you know in itself. So while we will talk about polymorphing, which is awesome, but we also have to change the mindset, the way people look at security itself. So what role is DevSecOps playing in changing mindset towards security where people are not looking at as an after the fact, but as Polly used to say, stop the attacks before they happen? I think, yeah, I think your uh, DevSecOps has been huge for security. Uh, and it's exactly what you just said. It's this idea of building security into your day-to-day -day process um, as opposed to an after-the-fact type thing. Uh, you know, historically, there, were, there would be uh, a security pass done. In fact, some organizations I, I was with literally had a, a block of time in their waterfall schedule called uh, security pass. And that's when you would do all the security work. And now the idea with DevSecOps says, Let's build security in from the get-go, not only at the architectural level, because again, you might use a polymorphic Linux uh, as the fundamental you know, foundation of your, of your containers or your virtual machines that you're running through your DevSecOps process, 
but then you would also use tools like Veracode or Fortify uh, and the like, and literally just run that scan and analysis every time you run your DevSecOps pipeline. So the idea being that just as a matter of habit uh, and a matter of process, you're always checking for security issues. Um, there's a well-worn uh, adage that the cost of fixing a bug uh, goes up by an order of magnitude every step of the way. So the easiest time to fix a bug is when, uh, you know, when a design is still on paper. Right? If a design is still on paper, easy time to fix a bug because it's still being conceptualized in your head and you can fix it. Uh, the next easiest time to fix a bug is, is when you've written the first time you write the code. And then as you go down the process, um, you know, if you sort of think about all the way at the end and you have a billion systems deployed and you need to fix a bug, that's, that's uh, very expensive, very time consuming. You have to do a lot of testing. It's, it's a, it's a, a big, uh, you know, pain in the rear, so to speak, uh, compared to if you'd fix that, uh, when you first wrote the code. And so these tools, if you integrate your security processes into your DevSecOps process, uh, it really lets you um, uh, find and fix issues when it's cheap to do so. When we look at the report, mostly we are talking about application. What about the OS? What about the whole library and framework? So uh, because uh, that is uh, that can can be compromised too. You know, application is just you know that is that is what you are running that you care about. But there is a whole uh, massive infrastructure that is running that one application. So to, to talk about how important important is the security of that whole stack as well. The report is covering uh, the application level security. They're looking at the applications that folks are writing on top of the operating system. And what we, I would encourage everybody to think about is not just their own application, but the entire stack that they're delivering. Right? Uh, their application typically is just the tip of the iceberg. So just like an iceberg, you know, 10% is above water and 90% is below the water, same idea happens in the system that you're delivering. You have your application, but below that application is the programming language framework like .NET or, or the JavaScript engines. And below that are all the system libraries. And below that is the kernel. And below that is the hypervisor and virtual machine. So you literally have billions of lines of code uh, in that iceberg that's sitting below the surface. And as anybody running Windows discovered with Bluekeep or WannaCry or any of these issues, even if you had the perfect app, and hopefully we've established that you can't have the perfect app, uh, if you're running on a vulnerable operating system, uh, you're in trouble because the attacker is going to go after that operating system irrespective of your application. So when you think about DevSecOps and that sort of security architecture, you have to think about the entire stack from the hypervisor all the way up to your application. Alex, once again, thank you so much for discussing this report uh, with me. And there are some very good advice that you gave to people and which about hygiene, which was also about don't get stuck in the streetlight effect, look beyond what is, you know, what you can see. And also don't just be uh, kind of obsessed with the application itself because there's a whole stack that can be compromised too. So basically have a holistic view and also embrace DevSecOps. That is really good to keep the application secure. But then you have polymorphing, which will make you sleep because of course, uh, Black Friday is coming, Cyber Monday is coming, Thanksgiving is coming, uh, Christmas is coming, New Year is coming. Everybody is going on shopping spree. And you know what, DevOps security teams are going to lose their sleep again. But with polymorphing, you don't have to worry about, hey, you know what, that's the patch we have to apply it in the middle of the night. No, your, your stack is fully secure. You can go and patch it whenever you want, but you don't have to worry about that. So Alex, thanks once again for sharing all those insights. And I look forward to talk to you once again uh, at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walt. No, that was a perfect summary. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be on your program and looking forward to the next time.